my specialization in the recent years is on cloud and grid. Okay, that's what I've been doing seriously in the last few years. Um, I do distributed computing. That has been my passion. I also did some research on that area. And that also extends into my research thesis now. So that's uh, if you wanted to know more about. What is this talk about? This is a one-on-one -on -one talk, which means uh, you're absolutely free to ask anything that you want about cloud. And I'm supposed to answer you. If I'm not able to answer you, at least I have to tell you where to find the answers. Okay. So that much I know about cloud because we started cloud in the Institute of System Science in 2009. 2008, we heard it coming. We were doing grid and we were trying to pack it off. We know that there were a lot of shortcomings with reference to grid framework. It is a very beautiful academic framework, but it did not enter into the commercial sector. So we were saying that we are going to retire this elective and start something new, which is cloud. So ever since I've been working with the team, so in this talk, I thought I'll just uh, go through with you a few things. So first thing is I'm trying to s tell you what is the real motivation for doing some cloud application. You know, why? why do we need cloud in the first place? We, we have enough jargons. IT industry is like a fashion industry now. right? We always come up with new acronyms. We change tags. Uh, we talk about new stuff and cool things. So this is another term, is it? Okay. So I'm trying to define the underlying motivation. Then I'm going to give you a, a technical way in which you can um, define cloud. And then after I'm trying to take you into some characteristics. For you to call something a cloud, what are the essential things that you're looking at? Okay. So if you have certain, um, it's like a blue litmus test. Okay? Uh, so you have these, these, these qualities, you can possibly call it as a cloud application. And uh, these are the things that people look at when they say they are doing cloud. And of course, we are going to weigh the benefits and risk and summarize the session. It's a very simple session. Uh, this is the first time I'm not doing any technical demos <laughs> or any uh, showcases or video uh, criticism of vendors, um, which is also part of our job. We do consulting on cloud computing. We also participate with the, our clients to do some tenders and things like that, where we criticize people and their products, of course, nothing personal. Uh, so this is the first time I'm not doing a, any demo. So you can see that my laptop is on the corner. And I'm going to have a very relaxed chit chat discussions with you. If you have any questions, please throw it on. Okay? I don't have a question slide and then I put it on and then fold my hands behind and then wait for you to ask questions. It doesn't work that way. So you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to stop me. Okay? So I'm basically an introvert, but seven years into teaching industry, I've sort of become shameless now. <laughs> okay? So you, you're free to stop me at any point of time. Ask me any set of questions that bothers you, that doesn't help you progress in this talk. So first, let us look at the outline. I'm going to do with, uh, start with the why questions. I've also been forced to do some sales and mar marketing now and then in my career. So what I realized by doing simple sales is uh, people don't buy your product because you describe the watts beautifully. Okay? They don't buy your product because you describe your house beautifully. They do try to buy your product or your um, thing that you're trying to sell because they, they kind of have a, a, a similar motivation or similar why. Okay? So recent days, what I have tried to do in my talks is I always put the why questions first. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm trying to say why cloud computing is here at this point of time and what is its selling point compared to any other context or any other model of computing. So I start with motivation. Then, of course, it flows technically. I define, I characterize, I criticize, I compare the benefits and risk, and I close the session. Okay, so that's how it is. General feedback is that my bit rate is a bit fast. I don't think I can work against my gene. But <laughs> what I can do is say, if something is not very clear, I can repeat it a couple of times. I know I have an accent, an Indian accent, okay, just like the long names. So if you want me to repeat something, please feel free to ask me. I'm I'm more than happy to repeat any number of times. Okay. So I'm going to start with the motivation. <clears throat> and as usual, anything that I present is, of course, copyrighted by my organization, Institute of System Science. And if you think this is interesting, you want to know more, more curiosity, you're, you're free to explore our courses. There is a, a page inside the booklet that has been given to you. And I have my name cards, so we can explore after we close the session. Okay, that's for curiosity. So when we start talking about motivation, it always starts with history. You know, what happens first? And then 
uh, how did we land in this position? So if you look into um, uh, the computing era, what people call it, parallel computing, distributed computing, academic term, company's term, doesn't matter. This is how you try to classify. It started with a web era, okay, whereby uh, information publishing was the starting point. When, when we had the WWW first time, HTTP was the way to go. Right? All we had was static web pages. People put information together, posted them as web pages. That was a very central place for information exchange. So people go there, find out what they want. Slowly, static pages started becoming dynamic pages. We had interactive applications. We classified them as web applications. Of course, we had technologies like servlets and .NET framework and so on and so forth that made life easy. They gave you a lot of libraries to publish dynamic applications on the web. You started using them. And the next era was web services, or in other words, integration. We speak about enterprise service bus. We talk about web services. We talk about REST protocols. We talk about SOAP, SOAP protocols, simple object um, protocol, which is useful for communication. So interconnect era is about how do you make different clusters of applications talk to each other. Okay? So that was, again, web era. And then we had uh, simple ways of doing transaction settings and things like that. So this actually pretty much describes all the past 15 years of uh, computing that's been happening. And then we started moving into discovery and automation. And this is where we had a lot of terms like UDDI, SOA, okay, uh, service-oriented architecture, and so on and so forth. So here people started talking about registries or yellow pages, just like Tech Kyung was trying to advertise the booklet. He said that the booklet that was given to you is on cloud computing. It has got the directory index of all the cloud companies that are providers as well as uh, this thing is a bit uh, hiding, so if you're sleeping, I'm not going to know. It's okay. Um, so just raise your hand so that I can see you clearly if you have a question. Okay. Uh, so, so this era is about registry, discovery, and usage. So you have central repositories designed around the web. You call them as UDDI registries. People register their services there. And if you want to consume, you go to them, find them the details, and then go ahead and consume. So this is pretty much what we have been doing on the... Uh, enterprise integration era, as I would like to call it. Okay? So that is um, the start of semanticness or more interpretations on the web. Web rather being very simple, dumb, HTTP stateless, it becomes remembering stateful registries and so on and so forth. So that was the next, next kind of uh, computing that we are talking about. And suddenly we have the new generation, which is social media, we all know about it. Okay? Too much of information, personal as well as enterprisey. We have uh, common places where we hang out, okay? And then the, we have uh, the analytics, which is the new generation of application. I heard that Twitter is generating 2 billion tweets a day. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of information of that is useful because mostly what I see is uh, people's personal information. Of course, we have too much of data, and we really do not know how to make up inferences from them. And that generation is the big data and analytics group. So this is one of the starting point or a better place where cloud finds a lot of um, applications inside. Uh, so it is, it is getting cloud ready. So this is how the web is evolving deeper and deeper. So from a very simple structural publishing of information, we are now moving into more deeper ways of doing intensive, data intensive computation as well as semantic interpretations from the web. Okay, so this is how the history moves. So what is uh, cloud trying to do here? Uh, cloud is just putting things together. I would call cloud a wrapper rather than an invention. Okay? It's a discovery rather than an invention. Cloud uh, technologies are not new. Okay? If you look into underlying technologies of cloud, we, would, uh, we can mention virtualization as one technology. Okay? Virtualization was invented in 1974, before many of you were born. So that is an idea of trying to dismantle the connection between software and your hardware, machine, okay? so that you can make uh, operating system middleware reusable across machines. So that technology is not new. It is very old. In fact, very, very old. Internet is not new. It is also old. Okay? Uh, what is new about cloud? It's about two things that is very critical that started having this term cloud computing. Number one, it's a business dimension. We start talking about utilitarian computing, or we say that we are going to pay only on what we use. Okay? So the pay-per-use model, which is a business model, is completely new in terms of cloud. 
the other thing which is new in terms of uh, cloud is internet speed we were not talking about broadband and this kind of mbps and gbps in the past okay so here at this point of computing we have a merging of the speed of the computer cpu power as well as your network bandwidth what do i mean by that um see this is uh, very near to your it show place so this is a good example if i talk about it show every year i come to it show and i regret so <laughs> what happens is i put a lot of money i buy the latest cpu say for example 3000 dollars and i'm very proud of my toy until the next year it is half the price you know that is happening right okay electronic toys particularly cpu is bound to be um invalidating itself every year we call it as moore's law in computer science the academicians say that the co computer's computing power usually doubles or quads itself every year okay so that is the rate at which the processing or the vlsi technology is moving what has to catch up is the bandwidth speed okay the bandwidth speed is dependent on the physical medium we start with twisted pair cable then we coax now we have optic fibers we have showcases here a lot of cool toys here so we know that we are trying to also quadruple the network speed so what it means is the time that it takes to save a file in your local pc is equal to the time it takes to save something inside the cloud okay so that is the junction point which opens up a lot of new things and that is what is the technical context or ecosystem where cloud computing becomes popular these two are the two gateways one is on the way in which we do computing which is the business model and the other the technology has matured itself to an extent that copying something in the local or copying something in say for example dropbox is not going to be much different the synchronization speed of the network is capping catching up with that of the cpu okay so these two are the enabling factors which opens gates to cloud computing platform So what is cloud computing trying to give us what is the motivation why should i move into cloud because when i keep data locally when i can maintain something inside my own pc i feel very secure there is no compromise there is no leakage there is no threats there is no vulnerability why should i put something into a public space right that's a question the the reason or the reality is uh, upfront investment and the typical it center pain points imagine that you are running a data center on your own you have lot of issues to manage okay it's not easy running a data center some of you come from systems engineering background so you know what i'm trying to talk about so that is what i'm trying to pictureize in this uh, slide here so if you talk about an it infrastructure that is being hosted in your own company in your own premise you constantly have three sticks that you have to work on and they keep changing very drastically you spend a lot of money and investment of energy and resources to keep up the pace okay so let me explain each one the first one is your it organizations policies the policies keep changing today they say you only have to secure this data tomorrow they change their mind they'll say secure every data okay and then they also come up with new compliance policies that is that's why most of us keep our job that's another story but generally they'll say <laughs> health sector they'll say this is compliant with ih7 ih4 ih3 so on and so forth so there are a lot of compliance factors okay so policy is one string that always gets pulled that always keeps changing not just the security not just the application but also the data and the other governance policies so we have to keep track of these things we have to invest a lot of energy to make sure that we are branded certified and benchmarked the other thing that keeps us on the toes is the data center okay a uh, data center can be very simply abstracted as compute power storage power network and all the other intangible things that go together to run your data center including the power cooling supply air conditioner administrator and also the security guards everything goes inside right so there's a lot of effort that you have to put in for you to manage your data center or infrastructure you have a lot of redundancy levels rates backups restoration policies catastrophe recoveries so there are a lot of thinking that goes there and a lot of money that goes in there and uh, here comes your play i am assuming most of the audience here are it guys project managers technical guys testers stakeholders business analysts so your job is to keep the application running which has got two parts one the architecture which is the non functional attributes of your application your reliable all the 36 lities la okay reliability availability security 
the moment I say live, I get that Singaporean feel. So, so excuse me if my accent is bad, but um, so the architecture part worries about the non-functional attributes of your application. And then we have technology frameworks. You have been doing everything with uh, ASP.NET and you put it inside 3.5 framework. There is something cool, there is new. You have more support for your ORM framework, you are pushed to move to 4. You are pushed to move to 4.5. These kind of technical upgrades also keep, keep you on roller coasters. Okay? So you just think, of, think about this a minute. An organization is really responsible for its policies, yes. But it is not responsible for all the IT policies. It has very specific policies that it has to worry about. And there are some general IT service management policies that every organization has to comply. Right? And then if you look into architecture and transformation, the same story. There are only certain set of concerns which are directly affecting my business, my line of application. There are a lot of things that are standards. And the, the whole of the data center management could be pretty much standard. Okay? What security algorithm that I'm going to deploy in my data center is pretty much what another, another competing company X is going to buy. Okay? So everything is sent. So why me? Okay? If my main line of business is not IT services, why should I go through all these pain points? That's the question. That's the burning question behind cloud computing. So if I'm a small organization, let us imagine um, I'm running a desktop publishing company. I'm not going to do software solutions. All I need to do is I just need to set up my infrastructure, have all my tools inside, and make sure I have a place to dump my files. I don't need a data center to do my storage. I can just rent it up from Dropbox. Okay? So that is what is this cloud computing's motivation question is about. Do I need a complete infrastructure for me to do a line of business that is not tangentially related to software services? Okay? So if my main line of business is not IT, I don't need to run a data center. I don't need to do a lot of upfront infrastructure investment. I get the technical experts to do the stuff for me, and all I worry about is only my line of business. Okay? So that's the clear motivation for you to move into cloud computing. Okay? So that's the asset test. Of course, depending on the technical stacks and different areas of delivery models, you have different set of questions. But the first burning question that you ask yourself is, all this upfront investment that I'm making, is it worthwhile? Is it going to give me the return of investment that I'm interested in? Or is it, it is good that it is being done by experts? Okay. So that is the real motivation question. Uh, so I'm talking about the first part, which I said, it is the business model that has changed. Business model is a very interesting term. The, the moment you use the term, uh, business school students will be very excited. Um, business model is a very simple term that reflects how you go about running your revenues and your expenditure in one simple diagram or in one single, simple page of picturization. That's what is essentially business model. So the business model in cloud computing is I'm going to use a pay per use model, which means I don't have to pay anything up front. I subscribe to you. You provide me the IT infrastructure or uh, the platform or the software, depending on which service model I'm going to pick. And all I'm going to be uh, having is a monthly or a weekly or a yearly bill, and I'll just pay for whatever I've used. Okay? So that is the business model shift. It's not new, because we have done that in history. You have your PUB bills, which talks about water consumptions and electricity, and this was always an utilitarian model. It is a national in effort, in fact, in most countries. It's usually taken by the central government because they don't want people to fight. And if you give it to local governments, they're still going to fight. Uh, we have petroleum, which is being utilitarian model, but that is a private utilitarian model. We have private companies like Shell and Esso and so on and so forth trying to distribute a national resource on an utilitarian model. Okay, you go and fill up your uh, private vehicle for the, with gas and you pay for whatever you use. Telecom, it's a joint sector. It's both private as well as public. Okay. You have government telecom organizations, private telecom organizations. They also do utilitarian models. So that is what your computing is also trying to shift. Okay? So just like your normal public utilities, I'm trying to make up computing facility also as a consumption model. That's the key shift. Okay? So the best analogy that I could give in Singapore context is uh, cars, of course. Okay? Because we know COE. We make enough jokes about COE. And we always um, like to talk about taxes. So we have three models here. 
one is trying to own your own car which which works good because if you have a family you have a lot of people and you have a lot of transportation needs different transportation needs and different timings owning a car makes sense to you but if it is not that big and um, you are only going to use it on a needy basis we have the best infrastructure for taxi services in singapore so you rent a taxi you just go where you want to and then you you come back okay very typical model and also it is stress free for example today i have been teaching till 5 o'clock and then my class ran rate i was very stressed i didn't want to drive all i did is i called a taxi and hopped inside and forgot where i wanted to go i gave him only the postal code he dropped me here so i'm really stress free you see so that is the kind of cloud computing model that we are looking at we have a rental facility either it is at infrastructure level or service level or platform level you consume it and then you forget it you get a bill for whatever you have ut- utilized so that's this and then we have the limousine kind of prime models with the taxis you want to impress your date or you want to impress someone you try to pick up a big 10 uh, tier limousine take it to a place and come back it's a premium and it is exclusive for you and then there is a lot of value adds in, our, in it and that is what is called as private cloud people call it private cloud may not be the right technical word but what they try to mean is there is some more value proposition inside there and there is a lot of uh, special services customized for the tenant okay so this is how you look at cloud computing by and large at its motivation on business model are you sure interested um, in knowing about more about how these things work and uh, if you are by and large interested or curious about how the shift is happening a uh, big switch is a, an interesting book by nicholas carr he's the first guy to document that the utilitarian model is going to give you a lot of benefits so you can pick it up i think all the nlbs have one he is also writing up a, a new book which is which is even more interesting he says our brains have become very shallow which is true you know nowadays i don't remember the address of the places that i have to go and the phone numbers that i have to remember because everything anyway is in my smartphone so i am really getting lazy and lazy which is true right so brains are getting shallow with all this internet and cloud computing that's an interesting book so this is for extension of your curiosity so we are done with motivation and what i have tried to sell to you is uh, cloud computing is going to be a a, a cost saving model if your key line of business is not it sector you are not going to be the software vendor you are interested in finding software solutions that supplements your main line of business then you will find cloud computing model more interesting and more um resource friendly you don't have any upfront investment done and then that's the easier way to ride on it infrastructure are we okay so i move on so next job is easy for academicians definitions we love definitions okay so i'm trying to define cloud computing so all that i've been saying in in words i'm trying to put them in into a paragraph so that i get some buying um before i go and put my own definition it's very important to always quote what the big guys say because you have a mentor or you have a standard organization they are always right so give them the due credits right so that's what i'm trying to do in this slide i have picked up two definitions which i always find interesting one is from the ieee the other one is from the nist nist is a standards organization uh, we also have uh, singapore spring standards which has got very similar definitions so if you want a localized version of uh, uh, cloud computing definition you can pick it up from the book or from the local standards uh, they are they are at sale by idea you can pick them up for your organization so the idea is ieee uses a lot of words but what they try to mean is you have an information that is being presented via internet the clients can be of any type of devices network uh, laptops smartphones monitors sensors they basically permanently stored in servers elsewhere it's not in your premise okay that's a very vague definition but that's a standard uh, definition from computing magazine ieee if you look at nist they have more technical terms inside so let me just read it a model of enabling convenient on demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources so when they mean computing resources they mean networks servers storage applications and so on and so forth so they can be rapidly provisioned realized with a minimal management effort they have a service provider okay so these are the technical terms that they've tried to put in let me just explore one by one on demand is an overkill we always use on demand um what will be nice is some uh, after reading many many definitions i thought i'll just pick the best of everything and then come up with a very quick one which usually works well see a cloud computing model has got few of these characteristics 
when you say that I'm having a cloud computing infrastructure, it's not necessary that all the characteristics are satisfied. At least three to four of this list is satisfied. Okay, so let me go one by one. Um, I prefer to use the word elastic in comparison to scalable or on-demand. The reason is most people think expansion is their only problem, okay? but shrinking is an equal problem. Always architects talk about scaling out. They don't talk about scaling back or scaling in, while cloud gives you the facility to shrink down your business. That's the best part. Okay? We are all optimistic. We are all very positive people. That's fine, but sometimes our line of business needs to be closed. We run out of business. Our pilots fail. So we have the facility to shrink back, and that's kind of very easy in cloud computing. That's why instead of using the term scalable, the cloud guys prefer to use elastic. Okay? We say we can expand, we can shrink back. So when you can expand your resources and shrink back your resources, you call your cloud computing as elastic. Another way that you simply define cloud is multi-tenancy. It's a general infrastructure. Taxi is being used by any Singapore public, including the tourist, international tourist. Right? So we have multiple tenants who coexist in your system, and that's a very important characteristic that explains that you cannot assume things for granted. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that you have to worry about, including, including security and privacy issues. So the tenant or the hosting infrastructure is always shared. That's what it means. Manageable and monitorable is usually your general administrative dashboard. So say I am being used uh, on a billing or a utilitarian model. There needs to be a facility that probes in on things that I use and then gives me a complete breakup of what I've used and how much I've used of each of this, right? So that dashboard is usually your management and monitoring dashboard. Most of your cloud vendor will give you this facility. They give you a console or a dashboard, which gives you facility to increase your metrics, decrease your metrics, watch your metrics, understand your consumption pattern. Okay, this is also another um, mandatory facility that cloud computing offers you. And when I say tenant, each tenant has got different needs, customized. I have different needs. Another tenant will have a different need. How easy is it to change based on needs? Okay. It could be a very flat offering, like McDonald's meals. They say set A, set B, set C. If you don't like it, get out. Okay. It could be a very interesting restaurant model, like I can customize your noodles as much as you want, give you all the value-added bundles, but I charge you a big bomb. Okay. So these kind of customizations and configuration is about uh, the flexibility of your offering. And these are the questions that we are interested in when you want to consume some cloud computing service. And of course, um, most of the time it means that your physical environment is virtualized, which means that your operating system is no longer physically tied to a physical MAC address or a machine. Okay? So today you can run Windows operating system on that. Tonight your, your application is not loaded, you remove it and run a Linux kernel on it. So operating system platforms, middlewares are no longer physically tied to a particular commodity machine. You can simply keep rotating them. We use a technology called hypervisor, and then hypervisor is like a language translator. Okay? So normally a language translator will translate from English to Chinese, Chinese to English. So hypervisors will translate from operating system to hardware, and then different kind of operating system to the same hardware. Okay? So they do the job of translation. And nowadays we have hardware-enabled virtualization, which means we have dedicated chips from Intel, which makes the process faster. Okay. Uh, three years ago, I used to say, what is virtualization? And I used to have a, a caution class to protect myself. I'll say this is slow. Because if you have an operating system that directly calls your hardware, that is faster. If you use a, a virtualized environment, you're going to add one more layer, so it is slow. Now that is not true because we have dedicated sub-processes which make the virtualization very, very fast. Okay? We have display adapters, we have hard disk adapters, we have virtualization adapters. So it is done at a hardware level. Okay? So it's pretty fast these days. And of course, we have spent a lot of time on the consumption and the billing, so I'm going to leave that for now. And then how we host our application, in cloud's term, we call it as provisioning. Okay? So we have different provisioning models, which I'm going to discuss next. And then we have our application and data, which resides on top of all these things. So the last two is your asset, and this is what matters more to you as an application or a software consultant, and all the rest is, be, is supposed to be taken care of by standard providers who are good at doing these things. Okay. So this is how we try to put up a definition for cloud. So when I, I can take examples. Amazon is an infrastructure as a service. 
and it has a virtualized environment. It has got monitoring dashboard. It is elastic. It is multi-tenant. It also gives you a, a very simple private and public hosting, which is provisioning model. Let us take, for example, uh, Microsoft Azure. It's a platform as a service provisioning model. It, it supports multi-tenancy. It is elastic. It also gives you a lot of configuration in terms of databases and in terms of the applications that it supports. Okay? So you can take any cloud provi provider, service provider, and map a few of these characteristics to them. It's quite easy and straightforward. Any questions? And please don't sue me if this is wrong. I'm just trying to best cover the big picture. So just after the definition, I want to just show you how the hype has been changing the last three years. Uh, cloud computing is a lot of hype. Um, in fact, I even attended lectures that says cloud not vapor, just stuff, no fluff, and all that. So you can see that it is most distorted area. Okay. Um, the problem is cloud is trying to ride itself on a lot of existing technology. There are very small things that is coming up as new, and many of the things that we are using are already existing. Okay. So when you sit into any cloud lecture, you will you'll half the time wonder, is this really new? Don't I use this already? Okay. So these kind of questions keep coming. Uh, so you can see that uh, there is a lot of hype. But what I want to insist from these three years, if you watch these three graphs, okay, uh, you can say that the first guys who got more stabilized is the software platform. Okay, uh, because that was the easiest to jump. And at software platform level, all you have to worry is the last two things in our definition, which is application and data. Okay? So this too is the easy to control, because you have already a good hand on how you design your application and data. To put it into a cloud application is kind of easy, and offer it as a service is even more easy because we have standard technologies like SOA, EI, and so on and so forth, right? Enterprise integration. So you can see that SAS has always been ahead on the hype cycle. Of course, I'll give you a detailed definition. And you can see that it is closely followed by infrastructure as a service, and the most fragile guy is the platform as a service. Okay? Um, so I will have to give you a very simple definition of what these are. Infrastructure means hardware consumption. Platform means technology stack consumption. And software as a service means complete application consumption. Only data is yours. Okay? So these are the three, three ways in which you can start consuming cloud services. Of course, there are a lot of branches. You have storage as a service. You have data as a service. You have security as a service. You even have testing as a service. I wonder if they come up with development as a service. I'm not sure. But we have all these acronyms flying left and right very frequently in cloud. But the most standard ones are IAS, PAS, and SAS. These are the three fundamental models that people talk about. So you can see that this is the last one on the bandwagon, PAS. And also you can see that towards the end of the crust, which is in the starting stage, is the different definitions of private cloud and platform as a service. Because um, privacy is a very complex problem. There are a lot of value additions and customizations done per tenant. So that's the most complicated to achieve. So you can see that it is the one that is to be last in the maturity model. Okay? So they are very slow. So you can see the trend is across. Starting from 10, 11, and 12, you can see the personalization and the customization is always behind. IAS and SaaS goes up front because that's the easiest one. In fact, even email services and office productivity services are the first um, kind of application that has moved to cloud. And slowly you can see that it is being followed by databases, big data, and so on and so forth. So this is the, the trend in which uh, the industry or the platform or the landscape is moving. Okay? So these are some hints. I don't say Gartner is always right, because there are wonderful predictions from Gartner nobody ever used. Okay? But this one was interesting. So now we have uh, sort of, I've sold you that cloud computing is beneficial. Then I try to define technical terms which are useful about cloud computing. The next idea is to translate the technical term into something that we can measure and test. So that is the next part of my discussion, which is essential characteristics. Okay. Um, so this is the essential characteristics, from, which is uh, very useful in NIST as well as in Singapore standards model. They pick up five characteristics. They say on-demand and self-service, which means it provisions automatically. If you talk to vendors, you know that it is not true. Okay, that's the utopia or the ideal way that we like to have cloud. So what we try to say is, uh, OK, I have, I have provisioned my application, and it can manage 100 users at this point of time. Suddenly, 1,000 people come in. My application will make a, a clone of itself. It makes 10 copies, and it manages the 1,000. Okay? In reality, no vendor wants to take that risk. 
he will send you an SMS, get an agreement from you, and then move on. Okay? So that is re reality. But the ideal situation is uh, self-servicing or self-provisioning. Okay? So it is very elastic. Depending on the traffic, it changes itself. The next one is internet speed. Um, we talk a lot about vendors being sued left and right. We know that there was an outage with Google. We had a, 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 a sector down in Amazon. So people always say, oh, these companies are sued. But what most people fail to notice is the backbone or the internet service provider are also equally reasonable for this kind of cloud outages. So there is a, uh, there is a very key factor in the technology, which is the broadband access. So when your cloud fails, sometimes it is by your cloud service provider. Many a times it is by your internet service provider. So they go hand in hand. There is a partnership. And there is also a set of responsibilities that they try to deliver for you. Okay? So that's an interesting characteristic that is worth mentioning. Resources. Resources at the end of the day can be any kind of a abstraction. If I'm talking about hardware, I talk about computing power, network, um, load balancers, firewalls so on and so forth, switches and all that. I'm talking about software level, I'll be talking about patches, applications, um, data, so on and so forth, uh, smartphone support, web operating system support, so on and so forth, multi-browser support, multi-operating system support, all this will be at software level. So at different levels, we talk about different resources as pools. Elasticity, we have done enough. This is, um, this is a very interesting area. Most of the cloud PhDs are churned out here. And the whole question is about what to measure, how to charge. Because doing a public utilitarian billing for electricity is very easy. They ch charge you based on the current or the vo voltage is consumed. That's kind of straightforward metric. But when it comes to cloud, the metric is quite complicated. Am I going to charge you based on transactions? Am I going to charge you based on the memory that you use? Okay. Or am I going to charge you by the time that your instance was on? As you can see, easily we come up with very complicated metrics. So we have to have a way to measure these metrics, write an agreement between the service provider and the service consumer, and make sure that we sustain the metric system. So this is a very interesting area. A lot of research is happening here. And in general, your type of services, examples could be something like storage, bandwidth, user accounts, so on and so forth. These are some of the examples. But depending on each of your delivery model, this metrics has got large variations. Okay, so this is how we try to charge them. So charge, charging is another comprehensive suit of things. Okay. It's not very simple like petrol or uh, not very simple like water consumption. Okay. So they, you have multi-dimensional metrics in, inside. So I'm just picking up certain things to show you how it is done. Um, so let us look at this model. Um, I'm trying to define elasticity in cloud terms. So normally in your data center, what you do is you just have your capacity. You have a planned capacity. You just buy your machines. The moment your capacity is reached, you go ahead increasing the capacity. It goes on and on. What it means is you have to every time write tenders, get vendor quotations, select a particular vendor, and then keep scaling up. Okay? This is what is a conventional way of managing capacity. And this is what is your traditional capacity planning deals with as well. Uh, but the idea of um, cloud is different. You have to make sure that you just have enough provisioning. So it scales up, you provision up. It also dips down, like I've shown you in the troughs. So you also scale down. So that is why you, we use elasticity against scaling. So that's the nature of cloud. Ideally, this is what we should be doing. But most of the vendors are wary of uh, the legal complexities. So they have different means of doing it. Some companies prefer re reserved instances. Okay? They prefer that you know where your peak load is and where your non-peak load is. So they like to ask you to do reservations like in normal um, public transports. So you can have reservation models. You can have demand flies, which means uh, alerts and alarms which comes to you, notify you that your load is increasing, and then react to it. There are different models in which we do, do things. Okay. Uh, there is an Australian research group that's do that does a lot of work on this elasticity and capacity management. If you're interested, you can take a look at their work. Virtualization we spoke about. Um, I'm just pulling the idea again so that I can show you with a diagram. Normally, in your traditional data center, your blue is your fabric, which is your machine. And your pink color or your green color is your operating system or the software portion of it. So in your traditional data center, your machine is actually tied to your software. Okay? You can't change it. 
that is why when you do licensing model you don't even do your licensing model based on ip address because ip has got duplicates so your licensing model is based on mac address right mac address cannot replicate it is very unique throughout the globe so all these traditional data centers work on cloud licensing which basically ties itself to mac addresses but with virtualized environment you are doing temporal time slicing at one point of time i run one image another point of time i run a different image i'm using the same commodity machine but in a virtualized environment i will be able to juggle around many operating systems many patches many applications that way i use my resources to the full capability okay and not necessarily the juggling is operating system since this is a server virtualization i'm using a server operating system example virtualization can happen at application level can happen at storage level can happen at desktop level can also happen at network level so virtualization is an abstract idea the idea is you start sharing different things with same physical resource it can happen with cpus it can happen with storage it can happen with bandwidth it can also happen with your desktop there are different ways in which you can virtualize there are many many companies offering you plenty of products which are virtualized so this is the next criteria normally i keep talking i cannot stop can i ask you to keep time for me just let me shut up after one hour <laughs> so being a lecturer for 6 years i lost the time control um <laughs> so <laughs> this is another interesting characteristic which is called as provisioning okay provisioning works like this i have an image a virtualized image which i was just now speaking about so typically your application has got web application it has got a backend uh, which is a mapping layer an actual database right so you can slice them and dice them as you want so what i can do is i can make a cluster out of this virtualized package i can make um, the application instances run in three cpus i can make a database version in one another instance i can make a data cluster model so the idea or my assumption in this in this kind of provisioning is my web traffic or my web transaction rate is too huge but my database is very small okay i don't have more data transactions i have a lot of web transactions so i have three copies of web application and i only have one data storage which is central to me okay this is one way of doing things there are many ways and of course you can also put a throw a load balancer on top so that the load balancer will distribute the uh, workload between the three application instances and so on and so forth so there's a lot of solutions architecture and capacity uh, management that is done on the cloud as well okay very 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 similar to traditional environment one additional challenge is the virtualization and instance so you have additional um, image management tools we call it as ovf open virtualized format and we have a set of tools that manages your images okay so that's how we have a slightly additional bandwidth there so <clears throat> when you talk about cloud you have two two perspectives that you always have to go back and forth one is the business or the economics and the other one is the technology okay uh, the technical geek guys are always worried about what technology to use how do you how to provision how to bake how to aha is not the typical baking it's the image baking here so how to harden my image how to make clone copies how to manage life cycle so these are the technical questions that you ask but if you look into the project management part of it what is the economics what is the business model how am i going to charge them what am i going to charge them on how is the frequency of charging okay so subscription plans membership groups so these are the economic questions that you ask about which is about your operation expenditure and your service level agreement so there are 50 50 concerns on both sectors okay uh, in fact what we find is that technology is the easiest to understand what is more comprehensive and complex is the economics part of it of course we we run a very detailed course on all these things of course there are also other guys who who have similar course curriculums you can pick up one of them and do a detailed uh, running on on each of them so that uh, closes my discussion on characteristics and then i'm going to define the categories which is service models okay so i'm i'm trying to just redefine what i've been telling during the hype cycle we have three basic models one works at a hardware or fabric level which we usually call it as infrastructure as a service another works at platform level which is easy for programmers and the technical uh, software engineers basically it gives you the complete technology dotnet or python stack or java stack it gives you the complete stack of tools you use that you deploy your application the last part is turning your application into a service that's a totally different dimension okay so when you are trying to give somebody an application your thought is on the product okay 
you're product centric but when you're going to software as a solution you're service centric which means there's a lot of customization done per per tenant your application is shifting into service model so your consumption is different your escalation is different the value proposition is different there's a lot of different thinking when you want to turn an application into a service that's a, that's a very interesting area in fact you can see most of the cloud consultants um, are from this group okay so if you are a software engineer and you want to do provisioning the most interesting pattern for provisioning is a saas wheel so i'll give you typical examples amazon rackspace easy to um, cloudwatch all these companies are giving you infrastructure um ibm is giving you infrastructure as a service uh, jboss or red hat linux is giving you open stack beyond this there is also academic community that is releasing complete open sources red hat is releasing something called as open stack which is um gnu licensed eucalyptus is another um, open source inside the infrastructure as a service which means you're a poor guy you're having a startup you want to have your amazon as one of your partners but when you want to take the data out you still want to be able to run it in your private hosting so you can use this eucalyptus eucalyptus stack which is basically trying to make cloud out of any commodity machines and they support open virtualization okay so we have lot of uh, uh, good contributions on open source inside the, this area which i like because uh, open sources always keep the vendors in check okay otherwise you will see that there is lot of politics than technology the second group platform as a service as i said earlier is not very matured okay though it is very interesting it looks more interesting to developers particularly because i'm i'm day in and day out worried about my java application i'm a java ee developer why do i have to worry about which uh, load balancer to use which no reliability availability to worry about all this is being delivered by the cloud provider for me i just worry about how i deploy my applications i worry about writing good patterns good catalogs good better practices best practices inside and then i have my application tested right so that that seems more interesting for a, a software engineer or a technical architect but the problem is the kind of middleware that is being supported is not uniform right if you take for example google app engine they give you certain set of services if you take azure they give you different set of services and if it is a python stack that is another set of different services and it is not very easy to tailor all enterprise needs so it's still a bit immature because of the amount of customization that the layer has to go through but in general when you see that this is coming up as a mature stack it's very easy for you to run something on your local id which is visual studio or eclipse and then you right click and then deploy the same thing on the cloud it becomes as simple as that okay no other changes needed no other additional tools needed no virtualization worry no service delivery worry so that's kind of very close to um developers and uh, technical crowd inside the services now we have changed ourselves into saas consultants uh, that's how we smoke the cloud <laughs> so uh what is new in this in terms of technology is uh, one thing that has shifted is big data uh we are moving away from the traditional cords rules uh, dbms systems rdbms systems we no longer need uh, 12 rules from cords to be satisfied we no longer need data normalization we are sort of relaxing the consistency and the transaction models we are saying that our tables or your da data is going to be very huge billions of records very very scalable which means we have to compromise on the rigidity of the nature of um, data being connected so we relax it and we call it as big table big data different companies have different name in general we call it as big data that's one shift the other shift that's happening in technology in terms of our software as a service is uh, how do you do this uh, um dashboard of consumption patterns and things like that okay this is very ideal for small medium companies and uh, most of the education uh, team like me are interested in training consultants in this area we we like to be service providers in this area while in this too we become mostly service consumers because this is a game of economy of scale okay uh, here you get cheaper when you have larger so these companies are big companies which offer you very cheap price these are the consultant groups okay, small companies so this is the level of control here i have operating system choices here i have middleware choices here i have application choices so you can see that there is a weight balance between the provider and the consumer if you want a detailed break up of how this control scope happens uh, we have a scope of control diagram here that explains it see the red is actually done by the provider and the blue is your control in general when you want to give an application you start from network storage hardware virtualization 
Then you go operating system, middleware, applications, data, right? Slowly you lose control. Everything is done by the provider here. What you own is only the data. And that too sometimes in formats that you don't even recognize. So these are the tricky questions that you have to ask your vendors before you go into them. Okay? Go into assuming or consume, consuming their patterns. This is NIST, the same diagram. But they try to give you a breakup of what are the things that you can expect. So I thought that was useful as well. So for example, at the presentation layer, you have to worry about the medium like data, video, mobile platforms, and so on and so forth. For example, at hardware level, you worry about compute network storage, so on and so forth. The, the questions get break down into smaller and smaller micro questions. Granularity is uh, very tricky. So you start deeper questions, and then more elaborate questions come up. Um, this is NIST's way of trying to define um, perimeters, which means, is the data with me, or is the data outside my parameter? Okay demilitarized zone, virtual private network. Um, in general, what is very popular is open public cloud. Majority of the applications are inside the public cloud consumption sector. We also have a very small place where we have uh, private cloud sector. And uh, Singapore government is also fostering one model. So if you're interested, you can talk to the IDA contact points. They'll give you all the details about their uh, private cloud, which is very friendly to government organizations and uh, related. So this is the sourcing cube, which tries to dice it into different sectors and say what are the different names for each of them. Uh, so I have given a very simplified definition. So this is what is your majority, which is public cloud, available for anybody to consume. And then you have a service provider and a consumer. Um, this is the private cloud, which is completely demilitarized in a peripheral security, typical example, government-based clouds. We have hybrid, which is a combination of the three. We have community cloud, which is very domain-specific. For example, all the photo community get together, they put all the applications that they share, and you have all this um, pin interest kind of social uh, networking as well, bundled into photo, photo groups. Okay? So similar, similar minded, similar applications group themselves together. Salesforce, okay? uh, PC productivity from Google App Engine or Google Apps. So these are typically community cloud examples. Okay? They're very domain specific and applications are logically connected. So this is how I summarize what I've been doing. There are essential characteristics. There are three different service models. And there are four different deployment platforms. And that defines cloud. Uh, that, that is the 101 end of a cloud. So when you're talking about cloud, there are three areas that you have to ask. You have to ask what are the characteristics that your cloud is offering. You have to ask what is the service model. You have to understand where is the deployment sector. So these are the three dimensions of any cloud application that you would like to know before starting up with your um, application being transformed into cloud platform, right? So where is it good? Is it good at SaaS? Is it good at IIS? Or is it good at just being deployed in a platform as a service? These questions you ask, start finding answers for them. Uh, so there are many, many companies. There are uh, international players. Of course, I try not to rank them, but sometimes I'm biased. I go by market share okay, and how their share sells. So you can obviously see who are the top guys now. IBM is trying to catch up um, very closely. You have Google, Microsoft, all of these guys are international vendors. You have um, specific vendors in Singapore. There's plenty, uh, much more inside your yellow book. Okay, so this was random screen grabs. Whoever had logo, I just stalked them using Google Images. Whoever did not, I just skipped them out of the list. So the, the full listing is inside the book. Okay, so. Your upfront capital investment is gone. That's a good thing for your investment. Uh, you have lower entry costs. There are barriers for you to try something as a pilot or a prototype is quite easy. All you need to do is run um, a test pilot. And then if you don't like it, you just uh, release that. That becomes very easy for your exploratory point of view. And that also gets connected to business agility. Your business transforms, so also your application. So it's easy for you to catch up with. Uh, trying to define new applications. So, so these are economic and end-user benefits, which is more on the business side. And this is also on the agility that I was talking about. You have flexibility in terms of technical architecture. And you also have a lot of operational benefits, which your project managers would love to have. right? So they like to have provisionings easier. They need flexibility. They need to turn it off and on. They make it elastic. So all these are uh, management kind of uh, benefits. So these are the good benefits. Finding benefits is easy, but finding risk and then mitigating them is a bit difficult, right? So these are some of the problems that comes along with the benefits of cloud. Obviously, the laws of governance, 
So the standard ones are now being taken care of by the cloud service provider, not by you. So you lose control. So that's a big question. You are vendor logged in. Okay. So we, of course we are, we can insist that you want open standards, open groups, and so all so on and so forth. But the compliance is a big question. So you have a vendor lock in issue. You have multiple platforms. Okay. You have. Um, not that you are going to get rid of downtime, it's just that you have roundabout way of doing downtime. You still have to ma manage patches, you still have to manage new application releases. In fact, it gets even more complicated. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you for your client, you can still make it a zero time. Okay. So you get up an image, while it is running, you pick up the other one which is well tested, you shift it with within, within zero bandwidth time and you put the other guy down. So that's kind of easy. You make many of these technical things transparent to your user. Because you have a world class infrastructure to play with when it comes to all these big guys providing you cloud services. So that part is easy, but it's still equal misery for IT department. You still have to go through all your standard processes. Features, security, customization is a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have um, groups of customers, member preferences, and so on and so forth. Audit trail. I even had participated in vendor rejections where they say that you don't manage audits. You don't tell me your application is hosted in certain physical locations. I cannot benchmark your application. So we have such kind of very funny, tricky requirements that we have to take care of. Okay, so these questions do pop in. And of course, we need risk mitigation plans. So what I've given is a very overview of these risks. But at each deployment level, there are plenty of service level questions that we ask. Okay? So if you're interested, talk to a good consultant or sit in for any of the detailed um, service level courses that gives you much much more detailed idea about all the individual technical and uh, economic questions that you would like to ask. So that summarizes my talk. Mm, I, I thought instead of putting few bullet points, I'll make a mind map so that I, it's easy for me to summarize. So I started with motivation. I defined cloud, gave technical terms. I defined uh, characteristics or essential things that you will look out for in the cloud. Then we looked into service model and deployment models. A little bit of marketing for the benefits and then a little bit of threatening for the risks so that you come to consultants and educationalists like us. Okay. So that closes my whole talk about cloud computing.